And now, the survival show that once survived a vicious attack from a miniature schnauzer. In this episode, James Price shares with us his trade secrets for securing your home like a high-value safe house. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 215. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Before we bring James on, I need to give y'all a little backstory on this episode because it's going to sound a little weird. This episode was recorded for another podcast I did for a company. And when I got done, I thought, damn, that was a really good episode. I wish it had been on ITRH. Well, the company ended up going through some restructuring or something and went a different direction with their marketing. A few months later, they even took this episode, or actually they took the entire show out of iTunes because they were still generating too many calls for them. Don't ask, I don't know. Uh, In total, there were 16 episodes, and these 16 episodes were tucked away and only available to the ITRH Armada in their private members area since that company took them down from iTunes. But it's always bugged me that this episode wasn't in ITRH. So, as part of our wind down to our summer break, I wanted to share this with you guys. And, as a reminder, we're going on summer break. The last episode of this season will be May 1st, 2017. The next season of ITRH will begin August 7th, 2017. You will, of course, get your ITRH Summer Shorts episodes every three weeks. With that, James Price on securing your home like a safe house. James, welcome to the safe house. Hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. So now, in one sentence, what would you tell somebody that you just met that you do? I think the best way to explain it would be that I create and enact solutions for problems, primarily related to the security side of the industry, say, uh, non-permissive environments, third world. Wow, very exciting, very international man of mystery. Yeah, I know. I'm a regular archer, right? <laughs> there you go. So now, how did you get interested in this topic as far as what you do and everything? Well, I started out in the security industry way, way long time, longer than I like to admit, but back in my 20s, which was a while ago, and started out working in the executive protection industry, which is more commonly referred to as uh, like bodyguard industry. But unlike the bodyguard industry, which is kind of like just a big guy who follows a celebrity around, the executive protection industry is more of a professional industry where you go to formal schools for and you work for several years before you're allowed to do assignments alone. So it's, it's more of the technical side and the planning side than just standing around looking tough. So then I ended up working in the third world and some war zones for a while, mostly Iraq, Kurdistan. I also worked in Qatar and uh, various places in Southeast Asia, also in the security industry. That's kind of what brought me around to where I am now, which is a uh, consultant for a firm I own with a couple partners. So now I understand you also, when you were in Iraq and stuff like that, you were guarding everything from classified documents to classified people. Yeah, I worked for a while as a security courier, which was um, for secret material and sometimes individuals. And then other times it was anything from executives to high ranking government members to 18 wheelers filled with $50 million. So everything was under a clear contract and uh, security and professionalism was one of the real big parts of what I did. So now today we're discussing how to assess a threat like a professional security consultant and what to do if things go wrong, which Sounds like you and I know personally that you are a perfect man for that job, of course. Yeah, it's kind of my trade. It's a, it's a very <laughs> thin trade, but uh, I've managed to slip, kind of slip into it and find my niche. But now, what would you say the number one thing people do to open themselves up to being a target at home? The most common one I see that everyone does is they don't lock their doors and more specifically their windows. It's like they just leave their house open. There's been... More times than I can count that a client would have me come over to their home and I do a security survey and there's a door open. I just walk in, I just walk in a back door, a basement door they forgot to close, or there's a window open. 
So just real simple things like locking your doors and windows. That, that's, that's really the, the primary one out of everything that I see that is the, the biggest and most simple to learn. But, you know, people get complacent or they open up a window for a minute because they're burning a pie or people still cook pies. And um, then they close it. And, the, and as they close it, the kids are screaming. Uh, wife or husband comes home, asks them something, and they forget. So I would say one of the most simple things you can do is just every now and then just walk around, make sure that your windows are locked. And then also make sure your do- doors are locked. You brought up a really interesting point as far as surveying your own home and, and making sure there's simple things. And it's, it's amazing that it's such simple things that people overlook. But when you're walking around a structure, what security issues are the primary things that you look for when evaluating one of these things once you've told them to lock their doors and shut their windows? One is I like to look at visibility from the street. It's like, how can the police see your house? Can they see your windows? If you have a lot of overgrown things or junk around your windows or shutters that blend in too well with your home, it's good to have contrasting shutters if that's part of the decorations for your house because it makes your windows pop. Access to the second story windows, how easy is it for someone to just pull a ladder up? You know, what's below it? What's beneath it? How, How steady is the ground? Fences, I look at the height of a fence, uh, the structure, how, how well they're put in, if they're, the main posts are put in with concrete or not. I uh, look at the garages, see how they open, see if they're, uh, how well lit they are, see the lighting on the street, how big the bushes there are. But uh, there's always things with plants and bushes. A lot of people have them, these nice boxwoods in front of their house, but you can't see their front door from the road. So it's visibility from the road for civilians because, you know, it's law enforcement, your neighbors, people like that. Those are things that, are, that I, I look at from a, a security standpoint. Well, that's interesting. The, the window one is something I've never heard before as far as having the shutters contrast from the windows. Why is that so important? Well, it's because I've seen a lot of houses where the shutters or the uh, frame would work around it are the exact same color as the house along with the window frame itself. So when the lights are off, everything kind of blends in together. So it's for me, it's also for fire safety, I believe, that if there is some sort of contrasting, then it will bring the eye to it. And it doesn't have to be an eyesore by any means. Most houses have multiple colors on them, either it's brick or it's black for the front door or, or the porches or around. So just have the those areas be that color. So when the police drive by, when your neighbors drive by, when you come home, you see it brings your eye to it so you know where those are you'll be able to kind of check and make sure that everything's okay. Now, I guess here's the thing, because things don't stay static, even though a lot of times we wish they would. How often should a person actually perform some sort of perimeter check on their house where they walk around it and look at everything, like really lay eyes on stuff? For most average people, it's real simple. When you come home and when you're leaving your home, when you open up your front door or when you, and when you pull up into your driveway, those are the two times to look around. Otherwise. Don't, you don't have to live your life like on this edge all the time, switch to one. It's a, those are the two times. If you're going to be a victim of crime, it will be when you're coming out of your house and more likely when you're going in your house, coming out of your car. So um, those, those are the two most important times, I would say. Okay. Back to your first question. Some of the other things that I look at when doing a professional security survey is the uh, main doors. Now, if you look at a lot of people have kind of these McMansion type houses and they don't have what's called a solid core door. A solid core door is a solid piece of wood. There's no filler. There's no um, like fiberglass or insulation in it. It's just a solid chunk of wood for the front door. That's one of the most important things because probably about 80% of the houses I survey, I can just kick a hole in the door. You'll be surprised how easy it is to do that. And the solid core doors, they're, they're a little expensive, but they're not terribly expensive. You can get one at Home Depot or somewhere like that. It's very simple to uh, install. It's the same uh, hardware patterns on all of them, so more or less. And if they aren't, then you can just play around with it. But definitely a solid core door. One of the other things, back to windows, is I look to see if you break a window without breaking the window frame or the cross-section frame, can an individual crawl through that window? There's a lot of the houses now with these double pane windows and things like that. They don't have the cross sections in them, in them anymore. And so when you pop out, break a window, a full size adult can go through. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah. So in situations like that, it's, it's kind of hard. It's expensive to change windows. But the, if it's a window like that, then I would definitely put a glass sensor on it 
for your alarm system. So if someone does break it, at least people notice it. Because unlike the movies, when you break out a window, all I have to do is take a piece of um, foam rubber, stick it over the window and hit it with my fist. And you're not going to hear a thing from the street and barely from inside. So it doesn't make any noise to break a window. So that's definitely something that um, if you do have one of those large double, triple pane windows with no uh, with, that aren't framed, then you should definitely put the uh, window sensor on it. And uh, the last one is one that I think is overlooked, especially in these days, how people live in, like I said before, McMansions and, commu- and other communities like that, is community, getting to know your neighbors, things like that. If your neighbors know you and they know who you are and they know what you do, maybe just throw a barbecue once every six months or something like that, something really simple. No matter what happens, at least you get fed out of it. <laughs> and then your neighbors know who you are, what you're doing, and they recognize you and your family. And there's a little more of a connection with with you and everyone else. So that if something looks wrong, if there's some guy like coming up to your house when there's no cars there and he's wearing like a jumpsuit and he's, you know, fiddling with the front door and he goes inside, they won't be like, eh, you know, it's nothing. They'll be like, hey, I wonder who's going in the Thompson's house. So it's definitely community is, a, is an important part of, of your personal security for your home in a suburban environment. Going back to the door for just a second, you brought up a really interesting one with the solid. And now for a quick break. Listeners, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? We'd love to give you more. Visit ITRH.net to find out about membership benefits. For starters, members get access to every episode ever produced and a monthly virtual conference. That's just for starters. And it's important to know in the rabbit hole is supported nearly entirely by roving horde armada members just like you that's how we pay the bills stay on the air keep the lights on around here so go to iturh.net to learn how you can become part of the iturh roving horde armada next up subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash iTunes or in the rabbit hole.com slash Stitcher or in the rabbit hole.com slash iHeartRadio or in the rabbit hole.com slash Google Play. Or if you are one of those weirdos who listen to the show through YouTube, you can go to in the rabbit hole.com slash YouTube because you know what? We support weirdos. However weird you want to be, we're all about that. Now, back to the show. Going back to the door for just a second, you brought up a really interesting one with the solid core door. Do you ever suggest the the more expensive metal security doors for the front and back door? No. I mean, unless you're you're running like some sort of high security area, it's not worth the trouble. It's uh, hard on the frame. A lot of times you have to replace the entire frame around your door if you mm-hmm. run these metal doors. So in my opinion, it's not necessary. But a solid core wood door, I mean, that thing's solid. I mean, I've seen SWAT teams hit them with the uh, battering ram. They got to give it two or three pops with, with a good lock. Oh, wow. So it's, it's the ability to not only absorb impact, it's simply that you can't stick a foot through it. I mean, really, on, on a lot of these cheaper or prefabbed uh, mansion-type homes and the new builds, the doors are have kind of a, I guess it's more of a polymer plastic outside with a wood covering. And then the inside is insulation to keep the heat and air conditioning inside. Unfortunately, you can put a fist through one of them. Oh, wow. So uh, solid core door is definitely whenever I'm doing a security survey, whenever I'm setting up a like a uh, mobile operations center in another country or a, a uh, safe house or something like that. The first thing I do is I replace the front door with a solid core door. And it's a really simple thing you can do, which increases your, your security level on your home to that of a safe house, basically. Oh, very cool. When you're setting up security systems, what are your must have pieces such as video motion, stuff like that? The first thing I would look at to put alarms on are windows. Windows are some of the most common. Most people, the front door of your house attracts attention. You know, if somebody's up there fiddling or putting the fist through the door. Now, it's easier done than than you can probably would think it is. But it's mostly windows that are not facing the main road. Those are the first places I I would put um, an alarm system on. And uh, then, like I mentioned before, if it's a single triple pane window with no frame in it, then a glass sensor also. That's the first thing. Uh, the second is the doors. 
the doors that I just the same way as like the windows, I would concentrate more on the doors that are not facing a road, not facing where people can see. So rear doors, a lot of people have a door from their garage to their basement or garage to their house. Uh, that's another one that you want to uh, ha- make sure and have an alarm on. And then the last one is just the simple. So it's the front door. That one's more for having the uh, look at the doorbell set up whenever anyone opens up the front door. Because a lot of folks, including myself, will leave the front door open in the daytime when they're home if they uh, open up the window or want to get a little air in. So it's nice to have if someone does come in, you get that little ding dong. Mm-hmm. So at least you know someone's coming in. But as far as if someone breaks in the front door, it's going to be when you're gone or it's going to be a home invasion. So you're going to know that they're there. So the main focus initially would be the doors and windows that don't face an area where people can see and then the front door. Those are the ones that if you don't do anything else, you want to do those. Next would be a motion sensor. Now, a lot of people install motion sensors, say, in their living room or their front hallway or places like that. When you already have alarm systems connected to your front door and windows, it's not really that necessary. The more important spaces, in my opinion, are what's called dead spaces in your home such as your attic or the um, unfinished basement. Oh, interesting. Or your garage where you park your car. Those are places where people will, if someone breaks in, and if they're a smart burglar or what they used to call back in the day a second story man, these are the places that people will go into first. If they're really going to try to sneak clandestinely into your home to rob it or rob you or harm your family. So on all the houses that I've consulted to look at, the Garage is the first place I'll put one. The second place is the attic or crawl space above the house because those are the two spaces that, you know, you're not going to know if someone's in there. You can't see it. You, you can't really tell if someone's there. So those are the two main places. Now, now for the crawl space, you got to set the sensitivity a, a little higher than you normally would. And it's better to have an infrared one, but so the like bats and things like that won't set it off. But if you angle it right uh, and play around with it a little bit, you'll be able to get it set up in a way that it's not going to have a lot of false alarms. But And those are also places that if a movement sensor goes off, in your attic, there's something going on. There's, it's not a uh, maybe one of the kids are running around in the living room at night. But at three o'clock in the morning, when your movement sensor goes off in your attic, then there's definitely something that's worth your attention at that point. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. And uh, video, video is becoming more popular now because of Wi-Fi networks and things like that. And before, when I originally started out in the industry, everything was wired. But it's really nice now that. Um, you can have these wireless battery powered ones that last a long time or only switch one when the alarm goes on. But people tend to set them in the wrong places, like on the exterior of the home. You're not running a prison camp. <laughs> so, you're, so you're not looking for people like no one's going to case your house and stand in your front yard and walk around. It's not going to happen. And exterior cameras are basically made for someone in a situation where someone is monitoring the cameras all the time. So it's kind of the old way of thinking of alarm of camera systems. But for a home, the places where you need to set up a camera system would be inside your house in a part of your home where people would have to walk through if they broke in. And the main reason for that is you want to get their faces on camera with good light indoors for the police to see later. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, through a main entry hall or mm-hmm. um, the staircase or a place like that. See, now that's interesting. And that's, that is quite a paradigm shift because I think even when I've thought of putting in cameras in my home in the past, I've thought about putting them outside. And what you've just said makes so much sense because like you said, you're, I'm not running a prison camp around here. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The reason for home camera systems are not for monitoring, they're for identifying the people who stole from you or broke into your home. So that, that's the main difference. That's why it needs to be in your house. Put it next to a couple of books and no, no thief is going to steal a book. So usually put them <laughs> near books or things like that, that they're not interested in a pot up of uh, potpourri and um, generally thieves aren't, aren't don't have eagle eye. They're looking for certain things. They're looking for big ticket items. So they see a stack of books with a camera and uh, uh, sitting beside it. They're not even going to notice that. So and also it's being recorded either on site or off site. So that that video will, will be there and for the police to be able to identify the people after they've broken into your home. So now, what realistic limitations should people be aware of when it comes to security systems? And as you talked about a second ago that don't have a dedicated security team sitting around monitoring them. You need to look at a security system like a fire alarm, that it's not necessarily going to prevent a fire or prevent someone from breaking in, because unless they're a sophisticated burglar, they're not going to really check for your alarm system and you know uh, wear a um, 
a, a ski cap with their face blacked out, clipping <laughs> wires on the outside. They're not going to do things like that. It's basically a junkie or a professional thief that's just going to break in and take stuff. Like I said, look at it as like a fire alarm. It's it's there to react when something happens. So that that's what you have to keep in mind. It's, it's a good idea to not, not have a ton of confidence in it, but at least know that once someone does break into your home or there's other any other type of emergency in your house, that alarm will go off and it will alert people. Okay. So it's basically don't think of it as a force shield. No, it's definitely not a force shield. And I think a lot of people get, get a little too confident about them in that manner. Like the same fire analogy I went to, your house is burning down while the fire department is on its way, but they will be on its way to either rescue you out of the second floor or put out the fire. The same way with the security system is you're still being robbed, but at least the police are on the way to either catch the people robbing it or to prevent any more damage to your home. And it also will give them the second the alarm goes off, the um, alarm sound starts going off, the, the people will start have to hustle. So it will definitely limit the amount of things being stolen from your home. And then many times with an alarm it would completely stop any theft from your home because they'll want to take off. Okay. So now that raises the question of when people are away from home, what do they do that makes that makes their home a target? Pretty much it's the same advice that's always been given. Have your mail stopped or have someone pick it up for you. Newspapers stopped, which I don't, not many people get newspapers today. So that's probably not an issue for a lot of folks except for older guys like myself. <laughs> and back to the community part. If you know your neighbors and you know, you live in a place that's decent and they're not, you don't worry about them breaking in when you're gone. Be like, hey, I'm going to be out, out of town a couple of days. If there's uh -huh. anyone in my house, then you need to call the cops for me. So okay. it's really that simple. And remember to lock your doors. You know, a lot of people, especially with children, you know, my sister has, has a bunch of kids and their husband and, you know, they're always in a hustle when they're even out of town. Have one person go through the house when everyone else is sitting in the car and ready to go. Just go through the house, check the windows and doors, make sure it's locked and make sure you turn on your alarm system. I can't tell you the amount of police reports and clients that have hired me who have said, yeah, my house got robbed and um, the, the alarm wasn't on or the house got robbed and the the door front door was open. Oh, you God. know, we we're in a hurry. We had to leave. The kids were screaming. We were two hours late to go into my mom and dad's place and we just forgot. And so that's a big thing. Before you leave, just check everything. Make sure the door is locked. Just give it one. Just It doesn't even take any time. Three minutes and you can run through your house real quick. Mm -hmm. As far as on the road goes. One thing I always do when I'm in a hotel room is I have a uh, rubber door stopper, like the kind that you use to hold open a door that's a, a spring-loaded door. Uh -huh. And I cut off the first inch of it so it won't stick through to the other side. And I just kick that in um, underneath the door. It prevents anyone from opening up your door. Oh, that's a very cheap and clever solution. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's an old one. A lot of people have been – I can't claim credit for that one, but people have been doing that for a long time. And it's – I think you can get them on Amazon for a buck so that it doesn't cost anything. Um, the other one is I get these uh, heavy duty twist ties. You can get them at any hardware store. Just the ones, you know, the ones with the um, a metal little piece of aluminum wire in the middle, and then heavy duty plastic on the outside. Yeah. And I and I twist touch the little sliding door lock. The one that allows you to open up your door like a uh, two inches. And uh -huh. I just twist tie that. And it, if you push hard, you can snap it. But it, it, it'll make a lot of noise if someone actually does know that there's something underneath the door and they slip it out of the way with a credit card or something like that. So at least it gives you that extra boom, boom before you get out of bed. But most likely most people, I mean, most hotels, unless you're staying at like a Motel 6 on the side of some road that also rents by the hour, generally speaking, <laughs> hotel rooms are safe when you're in them. So um, as far as when you leave, lock your suitcase. A lot of times theft in hotels are just casual theft from the staff. If your suitcase is open and there's valuable items in it, it's more of a tempting for them to take it. I also have a bike lock. I bike lock my um, suitcase to something, something heavy. So at least it's, it, it, most thieves are lazy. If there's an extra step involved, then they're done. They'll move on to the next room. So those are, those are some real simple things that you can do uh, when leaving home and when on the road. Okay. And now I know you're a big firearms enthusiast and uh, really big into firearms training, but what are some non-lethal tools you found to actually be effective in personal defense? Yeah. Um, first off, I want to say if you're not regularly training with a firearm and you just bought a pistol in case someone breaks in your house, just put it in a safe because it's going to be more danger to yourself and other people than it will to protect anything. So if you do head that route, get good training. But um, this is a really good question because a lot of the places where I will set up like secure areas or safe houses or 
small little command areas overseas or in third world countries where I can't have firearms. So I had to look at a lot of alternatives. And I I have a, a whole list of different things that I use, but overseas in a third world country, which are work really well here in the States also. One of the big ones is back to doors again, a solid core door for your bedroom. Now, I I 100 percent guarantee that all the doors inside of your house are are hollow core doors. That means they don't even have insulation. That means that I can just it's you can take a fork and punch a hole through those things. They're, They're pitiful. They're cheap. That's why a lot of construction people use them. And people don't think that you need to lock your bedroom door in your home. When I was living in Indonesia in the area where I was, a lot of it was kind of a wealthy area wealthy expat area and home invasions were an issue sometimes. So every single person who lived Indonesian and foreigner who lives in these upper middle class communities, they all have solid core doors for their bedroom with a deadbolt on it. So that's one thing because you're, you're not going to go seeking out in your home. If you know someone's in there, you just go, you grab your kids. If you have children, bring them to your room, lock that door. Now you have a solid core door for your bedroom. And with a deadbolt on it, it's not going to be easy for someone to kick it down. And that's if they really, really want to get you, which most likely they don't. They just want to steal all your stuff. So that's probably the first thing I would do. Have an area where you can retreat to that's secure and uh, while the police are coming because your alarm system is going off. A second one, this is one of my favorites. This is one I use. I use in where I currently live and I use at probably every single place I've ever been to is you get a California king size satin sheet. And then you put on each end, you just take duct tape and just take something that has a little weight to it. It can be anything. It can be a uh, roll of quarters or whatever you want and just tape it on the end and just throw that thing down your staircase. And if someone's coming up your staircase, they are going to just slip on that thing and fall all the way down the stairs. (laughs) That sounds very home alone. I have this vision of uh, Danny DeVito and the other guy (laughs) falling down the stairs. But if you, especially if you have carpet and even more so uh, if you have hardwood floors, I've tested it before. You cannot get up a a stairs with that thing on. So at least the person will will trip and fall and hurt themselves on the way up. If you have a camera in that hall, it'll be funny to watch later. And it's going to make it, uh, they'll injure themselves and give you the extra couple seconds to grab your kids, throw them in your room and lock that solid core door. So it's really simple. Get it on Amazon, 30 bucks. This is another one that I use and I always use it in safe house. And I use it in my own home. It's a uh, fogger machine. It's a fogger machine. You probably, if some of the guys, if y'all ever been to a nightclub, you know, the band comes on and then they spray out all this fog and it looks all smoky and cool. Mm. You have one of those in your home and all you have to do is connect a tube to it. You put that tube either underneath your door or, or you set it up in the hallway. Mine is actually remote control. As you go in, you can just click that remote control button and it'll just start spraying out this uh, smoke fog all over your house. You can't see a thing. And in the the Department of Defense and the Homeland Security, a lot of these other agencies, U.S. Marshal Services, where they set up safe houses for witnesses or um, high value targets that they've captured, they have a a more sophisticated commercial version of that that they use in case the place is ever raided by the bad guys. If you can't see, you can't fight, you can't steal, and it's a $30 solution. So that's a good one if you don't want to use firearms. That one is also hysterical. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's a lot of these funny things I had to come up with overseas that, you know, it's not a weapon, but I got to figure out something I can buy. And, and every country has nightclubs. Every every city has one. So uh, you can buy these things. You, I got mine from a pawn shop. They're, they're always in pawn shops. They're cheap. They don't cost anything. <laughs> and uh, you just switch that bad boy on. It starts spraying. You, I do it by the I always say put it near the room that you sleep. So it makes it even harder for the person to get there. And even if they are, it's it's confusing. A lot of people will think, well, won't they try to find the machine and turn it off? No, it looks like the house is burning down. So it's going to be confusing to someone and they'll leave. The last one I have is one that's it's a little more offensive, but it's CS spray like the police carry. It's like pepper spray. But for the home use, I wouldn't use pepper spray. Because pepper spray requires that you directly hit someone in the face or the body with it. The CS spray fumes. So all you have to do before you close that solid core door in your bedroom, stick your hand out, spray about half the bottle into the hallway and close the door. Mm. And nobody's going to be able to make it down that hallway. The reason I know it works so well is back when I was in Iraq, you know, I was on teams. We always used to play jokes to each other. <laughs> One of the things that everyone used to do is you would take a, a balled up wad of t- toilet paper or tissue paper, give it a, a quick spray, 
and then you throw it in someone's bedroom while they're sleeping or in the bathroom, which is even more cruel. But oh. yeah, I know. But even just that tiny little mid amount on a wad of toilet paper, you will have to clear out of your room. So you can imagine what spraying a half a bottle down the hallway is going to do. Nobody's going to be able to get down that hallway. You close your door, throw a, to- a blanket or, or a T-shirt or whatever if you have a thick door jam. No one's going to be able to get through. It's going to be too. It's just going to be too gross, and there would be coughing the whole way. Like I said before, people who break into your home, they're breaking into your home because they're too lazy to work generally. <laughs> so <laughs> even if you have a criminal record, you can get a job doing demo in a construction site. So they're not going to be someone who's going to force their way down a, a hallway with a fog machine going off, CS gas in the air, alarm going off, and then try to break down a solid core door. They aren't going to do that. They'd avoid that area or just leave. So that one is the only offensive one that, uh, out of my list, and it's something people can consider. I would suggest that if you if you do do that, go to any – call up a security guard company and ask them if they have a class for chemical sprays. It's like a three-hour class. It will get you at least familiar with it. I'm a big person that if you use something that's in the weapon category, you should get, get a little bit of training, and it's a – Easy thing to do. You and your husband or you and your wife can go spend a couple hours, take this class. It's kind of fun, actually. And then uh, you'll know kind of the ins and out of, outs of it before you start using it. But I would suggest that you do that before you consider it for uh, any sort of defensive purposes for your home. If you only had, say, five to 10 minutes to give someone three to seven tips on how to keep themselves safe, what would they be? One is, like I said before, lock your door. The second is, of course, have a security system, alarm system. So many people have homes, and the alarm systems aren't expensive like they used to be with all the drilling holes and running wires. It's just peel and stick, and the batteries last for a year or years. It's it's really simple. It's a couple few hundred bucks for most packages. Have an alarm system. Another is to just make sure that um, when when you're going in and out of your house, make sure to look around. Make sure that there aren't any um, suspicious people going around or uh, that your front door's open or it's obvious that you've been robbed already. And then the solid core doors for your house. Those are really the best ones that I can say in just a quick couple seconds. Awesome, man. I sure appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate being on the show and I wish you all the best of luck with everything. Thanks again. Thanks, man. Connect with James and support his humanitarian aid group by going to dvmhasf.org. That will also be in the show notes today. Countdown to the season ends. The last episode of this season will be May 1st. ITRH will return from summer break, August 7th, 2017. And you will get your ITRH Summer Shorts episodes to tide you over while we're away. Show notes, resources, and links from this episode can be found by going to intherabbithole.com slash E215. Support the show by going to ITRH.net and becoming part of the ITRH Roving Horde Armada. In the Rabbit Hole is supported nearly entirely by listeners just like you. Seriously, visit itrh.net to support the show and get members-only benefits. With that, we wrap up episode number 215 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. <laughs>